Still gotta call you back though. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Give me like a 60 to 90 seconds and I'll call you back. Okay, thank you. This is so fun. Yeah, I didn't see that coming either. <laughs> now bear with me. I'm here in the library. You remember the library? Oh yeah, this is my favorite library. I'm still up there. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, if I leave the lights on, the glare shows up on the video screen. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this video here to have you on. Oh. Cool. Then if I here get some sort of shot okay. like that, but I've already got the live feed running, so you're already live on the internet. Oh. <laughs> there you go. But bear with me, I've got to get you up on this screen. So I've got to get 
the right yeah, HDMI cool. cord. I'll be right back. Hope that this cord does the trick. All right. And then I've got to go and get, uh, I saw the email came in. I got to get you to download your attachments. So, okay. yeah. And if all this takes too long, then I got to put something on the screen telling them I'm starting late. But hopefully I won't. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Six, two, three, Hmm. Times like these. Yeah, I think it works better because, like, you're looking at two lectures. I hope it works better. I, it's certainly my goal that it works better. What happened was they made me take a training class on how to use WebEx and Canvas combined to do this. And they had me and about 12 others from a distance and about 20 others gathered together in person. And despite all that brain power being in one place at one time, no one could get the WebEx and Canvas to work. And I thought, well, if that's the best they can do, how am I going to do better? <laughs> so I decided, I decided not to use the Canvas or WebEx. All right, got you plugged in. Now I got to get the source right. You know, HDMI 1, HDMI 2, HDMI 3. Okay. Oh, did I get it right in the first guess? Maybe not. Okay, let me try another source. There's only four of them, so it can't take me too long. Oh, there's only three of them, so it can't take me too long to get the right one. All right, let me try HDMI 2. Thanks for bearing with me through all this. Yeah. No, take your time. Oh, that's it. You just came through the big screen. At least the audio did. Yeah. Is that your house? It's beautiful. Oh. Your park? Oh, you like that? I took that picture. Is it your house? No, that's Park Avenue. This is Park Avenue over here, and this is the, the park side of it. You know, downtown Winter Park. I took that. It's, it's one of my favorite trees. If I'm pronouncing it right, it's pronounced Tababuya. Maybe it's Tabuya. It's a, it's a tree. It blooms usually in February or March, and it's out of bloom by April. I just love them, so I try to get a good picture while I can. It looks like one of the preset backgrounds. So perfect. Hey, thanks. <laughs> I'll turn up your volume to make you louder. If you don't mind saying something, that'll let me know if you're too loud. Okay, testing, testing, one, two, three. I think that's good. All right, that now, better? Yeah, now I gotta slide you over. Where's the cursor? over to the big screen bear with me all right and then expand okay and then let me move you over a little bit so more natural how's that perfect i'm looking at it on my phone right now it looks completely fine okay and you can still see me Nope, uh, it's just because it's a little bolt behind, but right now I can see you. Oh, okay, cool. How's the audio like? Do you hear me? Um, one second, I'm going to mute myself so I can hear it on here. One second. But if you mute you, how am I going to hear you? Well, let me see. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to mute myself so I can hear you. Hey, there I am. I tell you, it's, it's hard being as beautiful as I am. <laughs> And it's hard being humble, you know, when you're as great as I am. So, <laughs> all right, let's see. Let's see. So where should I be looking when I talk to you? Keep looking straight like at the camera. That looks normal. You like that? Yeah. Should I move you over so that when I'm looking at the camera, I'm also looking at you? I'm good with whatever works for you. Because you're seeing like my ear now, I'm not visible. right? <laughs> okay. Hold it's on. like I'm looking at your face on my phone, and then I'm looking at the side on the screen. Oh, okay. Let me try to get you something less side angled. Is that any better? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I got everything but your downloads now. It's not a big deal either. I mean, I could probably just talk about them, but. But but you really want them to see them. Okay, um, all right. Because one of my computer, it, 
I don't want to mess it. I don't want to mess you up. I can. I can do this. I can do this. All right. Uh, just let me tell the class that I'm starting. A couple minutes. Okay. Later. Yeah. Hello, class. If you're there, let's see. It says 13 of you are there. So uh, we're going to start in approximately three to four minutes. Uh, excuse me for being to blame for the late start, but wanted to get Miss Stouse's uh, handouts ready so I can hold them up and you can see them. So let me start four minutes late. Uh, Kaylee, give me about four minutes if you don't mind, and I'll turn the camera toward the books so that you don't have to worry about being on YouTube while while we're waiting here. So. Never been a YouTube celebrity before. <laughs> So every now and then somebody's got to be a YouTube celebrity. I guess it's us. <laughs> All right, let me. I'll be back in just like three, four minutes. Let me get those downloads onto a screen. I'll be right back. One down, two to go. I'm getting there. You got it. All right.
Okay, I got the two shorter ones printed. The, Perfect. The 59 page one I've got on like a video oh. screen. I'll okay. hold it up or something. The 59 page one, you can just, I just need the one essay off of it. Oh, hey, if you don't mind telling me which PDF page, I'll hit print. Yes, sir. Absolutely, it is. Um, if I'm correct, it's the one that says similar essay. It, it's oh, page. I printed one called similar essay. Um, is that the, I think that one's 59. Morning session, Tuesday, July 30th, question number one. Okay, that's perfect. That's, that's one of them. Okay. And then this one is uh, the one that's the 59 page document. Yeah. I did, um, it's page eight in the document. Got it. Or five. It's uh, February 2019 bar exam, the Charter Review Commission of Blue County. The Charter Review Commission, Blue County. All right, got it. Yeah, that's right. one. It's, um, I, it's actually page um, 31, the city of Metro. All right, 31. Getting there, getting there. Yeah, uh, question number two. Got a school now. Sorry, I should have told you that ahead of time. No, 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 no. I should have done this ahead of time. This is not your fault. But it's definitely PDF page 31. I'll just hit print instead of scrolling to it. Is that what you're saying? Am I hearing you right? Yes, yeah, sir. It should be question number two. So it should be pages 31 and 32. Okay. Or I guess like when you press control print, it would be... or. Command print, there would be 33 and 34. Okay, that one's printing now. Perfect, perfect. Right, class, if you're listening, we should be ready in about two minutes. Two minutes. Let me go get that out of the printer. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stouse, I think I finally got it all printed. Okay, perfect. I'm probably ready to start the class if you are. Perfect, I'm ready. Okay, let me turn this camera around so everybody can see us. All right. Let's I'm so sorry, one second. My, back, my robot back and just turn on. That is so cool. I've always wanted one of those. No, that's cool. I would love to have a robot vacuum. All right. Now, I just got to get this camera facing the correct way. My goal is to have lots of screen filled up by your video. I'm 
probably achieve that. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. I started class about 10 minutes late, and I apologize for that. Maybe I'll shave a couple minutes off the break and still end on time. Does that sound fair? Okay. Hope it does. But anyway, here we are in class number nine. We're making our way through the semester. Sure, we can't meet face-to-face -face anymore because we've all got to be at least six feet apart, right? But that's not going to stop us. We're still going to finish the semester. We're still going to get you all the information you need to both pass the Florida bar exam, become a lawyer, and become a successful lawyer. We're going to get you the information you need. This class is not going to be an obstacle to you achieving your hopes and your dreams and becoming a lawyer. And you know that's my goal. I'm here to help you. Gotten a few questions over the break. Happy to get them. Anytime you've got a question, please email me. You know my email address, patrick at mcginleylaw.com. Some of the questions were along this line. You know, what chapter am I covering next? And the easy answer is the one that comes after the chapter I covered last. <laughs> but what I mean by that is if you look at the syllabus, it lists uh, one after the other which chapters we will cover. And we have not varied from that. So just like we covered chapter two after we talked about chapter one and we covered chapter three, just like we talked about after chapter two, we're going to continue to do that in the live video. No changes there. Also, I've mentioned before, and I'll mention again that some of our classes will cover more than one chapter. Why is that? As I mentioned before, there are some things that are more important and some things that are less important. And to the extent that I've been successful in life, to the extent that I have, that's been because of those times where I spent more time on what was important and less time on things that were unimportant. Or of lesser importance. So I'm trying to lead by example, trying to do the same thing here. The chapters that were earlier in the text were earlier because they were more important. The chapters that happen later in the text are later because they're of less importance. Likewise, sometimes we cover more than one chapter in a class. Why is that? Well, the first answer to that is if you look at our syllabus, it says that that's what we're going to do. So I'm being true to our syllabus, covering more than one chapter in a given class sometimes. The other reason is the whole more important, less important thing. You know, uh, if a chapter's of less importance, I spend less time on it. And the third reason for that is, is that not all the chapters are of equal length. For example, we had one chapter that was 58 pages long, and then we had the chapter we just finished in our last class, which was four and a half pages long. Wouldn't make sense to spend just as many minutes of lecture on a 58 page chapter as we do on a four and a half page chapter. Naturally, you got to spend more time covering 58 pages than you do covering four and a half. So those are the three reasons why many of our classes will, just like the syllabus says, cover more than one chapter. So there they are. And of course, as we've mentioned, it was always my goal to get ahead of the syllabus. One of the reasons for that is that I could give you a review of the entire semester before the semester is over. And we've had great success in getting ahead of the syllabus. So much great success that I've stopped and asked myself, what's the most important thing I can do with the time spent being ahead of the syllabus? I figure the most important things that this class can do is to help you prepare to practice law and to help you prepare to pass the Florida Bar Exam. And that's where our guest speaker comes in today. Ms. Kaylee Staus, how are you? Hi, Professor McGinley. How are you today, hey, sir? thank you. I'm not a professor, but thank you. <laughs> it's always good to talk to you. So uh, now, now you, you are coming to us live from Alachua County, Gainesville? From Ocala. Ocala. All right, forgive me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been It's been, what, only a year since we stopped working together? I'm losing track of you already. I know. Too long for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, uh, you and I met where? In my floor con lab class, I think. <laughs> two years, almost three years ago now. My two L year of law school, yes, sir. Yeah, and you're an alumna of the Barry University School of Law. Yes, sir. I graduated yeah. last May and I took the Florida Bar exam in July. I did pass my first time yes. and I'm practicing attorney now. I'm actually a prosecutor here in Marion County. So I'm doing criminal law. I am a published author and I'm actually writing part time for a UBE bar prep company. I'm writing model essays. So here to share a little bit about what it's going to take for your class to pass the bar. Hey, thank you for doing that. So you were where they are, so to speak. You're an alumna now, but you were a student then, just like they are right at their law school. So you know exactly where this audience is coming from. 
Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and you've passed the Florida bar exam and now you're writing uh, sample essay questions for a company that is helping others pass the Florida bar exam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, wow. Well, it's an honor to have you here today. You're a great help. Uh, anybody who's taking this class is taken because they're required to. Why were they required to? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but the logic might be that yeah, the topic well, shows up on the Florida bar exam. So exactly. there you go. And, and many of our of future alumni and alumna will be taking the Florida bar exam. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your insight. And uh, before I let you get to all the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the, the professionalism, I got just two things to cover. Uh, first is uh, just like when you were in my class, I start every class with the prayer. So yeah, uh, I thanked your class for letting me do it. I thank my current class for letting me do it. And there's always time for prayer, in my opinion. And it's probably no time like the present with all this crazy coronavirus. Going Extra on. prayer is needed right now. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So this prayer, as always, is with you, my students, and it is for you. I'm praying for your health, your welfare, your well-being of you and yours, your loved ones, your friends. I'm praying that once we put this craziness behind us, you're going to pass the Florida bar exam or whatever bar exam of your choice you might take. And I'm praying that you're going to have a wonderfully rewarding and successful career practice in law, doing the Lord's work of helping others navigate the legal system, righting wrongs, fighting the good fights. Like you and I used to do, Kaylee, when you're working right here in this library. <laughs> yes, so, I miss that library. It's the nicest law library I've ever gotten to work in. Hey, thanks. I love it too. All right. And with that said, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by that confidence, we fly unto you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you do we, do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, hey, Ms. Stout, so you've got a great program for us. I've done my best to, to print some of the information. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to use those printouts quite yet, but I'll just, uh, as I get to there, I'll let you know which ones. And Thank you. We'll show them to everyone. Thanks for doing that. So the reason I'm here is, just like Professor McGinley just said, is I was in your shoes last May, not doing online classes, not <laughs> amidst the global pandemic, but about to graduate, about to take the bar exam. And as some of you might be feeling, Lots of apprehension, uncertainty, not sure what to do, and just, you know you want to pass, you kind of know how to get there, and this is hopefully going to help you get a better game plan together of how to follow that path to passing the bar and becoming an attorney. So I'm sure most of you are 3Ls right now, some of you are 2Ls, you can listen to this as well, and hopefully get a head start, but if you are in bar prep class with, um, I think it's bar survey or bar essay right now. This might be some of similar information that you've heard, but this is just the thing. These are just a few of the things that I wish I would have known in addition to what I was learning in bar survey and bar essay. So court of con law is one of the most heavily tested for the bar topics. It's tested almost every year, sometimes in the spring and in the summer. It, it or I should say the winter and the summer. And it can be on its own as a topic. The bar examiners like to mix the Florida Con Law issues in with other topics such as property or maybe there's a regular larger Con Law issue that they like to mix it with. And most often they like to miss it, mix Florida constitutional law with professional responsibility. So with that being said, Florida constitutional law is very important to studying for the bar and passing the bar exam. 
you know, you guys have an advantage in Professor McGinley's class because he has his nice, concise textbook for you. He gets you the slides. And the good thing about Florida Common Law is it's a more concise subject, in my opinion, than the other bar topics. And what I mean by that is there are more concrete topics that can be tested. And this makes it easier for you as the student preparing for this test because once you learn those topics that have been tested in the past, you're not going to be throwing a curveball. You might be throwing a curveball, but chances are everybody else is going to be throwing that curveball with you. But most often, if the bar examiners are testing these same Florida con law issues over and over again, so as long as you are reviewing those past essays that are on the Florida Bar website, which I'll show you in a little bit, um, and you're reading those past essays and the past model answers, chances are you're going to have a very similar topic and answer that you can submit and write and type in your one hour you have to write your test, exam your test essay. So it's tons of information that you have right now. I'm going to tell you guys what worked for me personally in helping you organize that information. So starting last January, so that was the beginning of school year, I printed out all of the uh, all of the past Florida Bar essays. And I'm just going to put this in the context of Florida Con Law. So what I would do is I would get all of the essays for Florida Constitutional Law, and I would do this with every subject. And I would take this information and I would sort out all of the different essays that have been tested over the past 20 years. And as you're reading this information, you start to see patterns pop up. You see certain fact patterns, just like with law school, that correspond with certain issues. Now, once you read these essays and read these model answers that the Florida Bar is gracious enough to give all of us, you can recognize what problems and issues go with what facts. So today, in a little bit, I'm going to show you a an example of an essay from 2017 that was very similar to the past bar exam that we had in 2019. And you can see that there are different specific facts, but the issues that go with these facts are very similar. So that's some type, that's a, some, a skill that you can practice leading up to the bar exam and leading up to graduation is recognizing what facts go with what issues. Now, you guys are in a very unique situation right now where you're having to drive to class, you're not having to go out and do as many things as you normally would. So, honestly, you can take this tragedy as a blessing and be able to um, get your bar studies organized before the summer even begins. So, um, the, uh, this is just a little outline of what we're going to do today is we're, I'm going to explain to you the format of how you will structure your essay. We'll look at an actual essay and then we'll discuss the issue sheet, the issue list um, that will help you write your essay. So, Professor McGilly, do you have that, um, the issue list? I sure do. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to have to show right. that to the class. Okay. I'm going to turn on the lights so we can read that better. Yeah, absolutely. So what Professor McKinley has right there is something that I made myself. It's an issue list of Florida constitutional law topics. And what that is, is whenever I was going through those bar essays from the past 20 years, I wrote down every issue that I saw throughout the different essays. So, for example, there's statutory, statutory interpretation that Professor McGinley goes into in depth. Um, there's um, the invasiveness of the Fourth Amendment, constitutional searches and seizures, these different topics that you'll see over and over again over the 20 years. I listed all of these topics out and I organized them by the different larger topics. So if you see at the very top, you see lawmaking, and then underneath it, there's about eight subtopics that relate to the lawmaking. Underneath that, you see individual rights and stand, standing. You see more sub-issues under that. And what this list allowed me to do was organize all of these different topics, which can be overwhelming at some times, and make them into smaller subcategories. So whenever I'm reading an essay, if I see an essay that has to do with lawmaking, which is an example I'll show you guys today, I knew right off the bat that those 
eight issues would be for sure in that essay. And so I would know to look for those issues and discuss them in my essay. It's very important to have something, having this organized basically outline of what you're going to write about before you go in is very beneficial because it will let you pre-write basically your essay and have less chances of forgetting something. So um, I call those my Florida specials. Those are what he's showing right now. Those are this particular constitutional law issues that are special to Florida. Those are very important for Florida bar examiners because people come from all the United States to take this Florida bar exam and they want to make sure that you as a Florida attorney know what makes Florida law unique and they like to test those particular issues. So just a second, we're going to show those other um, those essays and how we'll be able to use those issue lists to be able to dissect and pull apart that essay and write a model answer. Sorry to be goofy, Kaylee, but you took no, my class. You know I can't stop class. telling goofy jokes. This is great. It's more interactive that way. Like, right. PowerPoint. <laughs> and if you have any questions about how I organize this or how I – somebody just asked, can we please email this? Uh, Professor McGinley has those. He can share them if he wants. Um, he has my email address. If you have any questions um, about that, I'd be glad to help you as, as well. Um, whatever – Professor McGinley would like to do it's up to him. So happy to help. Um, thank you so much. So let's look um, next at essay format. I'm going to talk about that. So um, Professor McGinley, before I go into that that essay, I'm just going to talk about um, how you lay out your essays. Okay. So if for those of you that have Professor Can, I'm pretty sure he teaches bar. Florida bar topics or something special like that. This was a very important tip that he gave me whenever we were in his class. And it was when you're going through the essay and reading it in the actual test, do not write anything down. Everything needs to be typed. And that is something that I had to adjust when I was taking the test. I was always studied at using the scratch paper and jotting down notes and making my nice little outline. Well, realistically, you don't have time to do that when you get in the actual test. So whenever you get your test and you spot an issue, you need to make sure that you're typing it or if you're handwriting the test, um, you can handwrite it into your actual essay. But make sure that you are putting that actual issue into your computer. One, there's less chances of you forgetting to move an issue over from your scratch paper or your notes. Two, it's going to save you time because you're not going to have to type those words again. And three, it makes it more organized. So once you get your outline of how you're going to write your essay, you're just going to basically fill in your issues and then move on to your next essay. It's very stressful and it's very chaotic. I cannot tell you what I wrote down on my bar exams. And I think afterwards I called Professor McGinley and I was really excited <laughs> because I got a Florida bar question. I remember that call. <laughs> I was super nervous the day before, but afterwards I felt super, super good about that essay because awesome. I had used my format. I filled in all the information that I had learned from my studies and then from the class with the professor, and I felt very confident that I had included all of the necessary information that would it that would take for a passing exam, uh, for a passing score, because. I made this full clip outline where I fill in my information, I'm not going to forget something, and I move on to my next essay. Florida con law is a, in my opinion, less difficult um, subject on the exam because the issues are more concrete and finite. Um, there's black and white rules, you can analyze them, compare them to the facts, and you're good to go. But Saying that it's a less difficult topic to get doesn't mean that you don't need to study for it. What I'm saying is it can be an easier topic if you apply yourself and learn the rules that you need to. Um, that list that Professor McGinley just showed you of all of the different issues, um, as you're going through your studies and compiling your list, this was kind of a game that I did with one of my study buddies. I went through and I would write down as many of those issues as I could from my memory leading up to the bar. So every couple of days I would cycle through this subject and we would race. We would give each other maybe five or ten minutes and we would write as many topics on that list as we could to see what we could remember in a time situation. 
Now, once we did that, we would read the topic and then we would write down a little rule about that topic. So this probably took total maybe 15, 20 minutes to do. It's just a little exercise. But what it did was show me what I did and did not know on those rule lists. So by the end of your bar prep study leading up to the bar, you should be able to see the word sunshine in the essay, and you should be able to write one or two sentences about what Florida sunshine laws are. And I know Professor McGinley goes over all of these different topics in depth, and you can use the rules from his slides, from his textbook, what he's giving you. You can use the, the past bar essays, but you need to be able to write a couple of sentences about each of one of those topics, because each sentence that you can write is a point, spotting the issue is a point, and then being able to analyze it with the facts is a point. And you need to be able to write down as many issues as you can to build up those points for your bar score, for your essay score. So let's go ahead and Professor McGinley, yes. if we can look at the um, the printed the similar essay I believe it's Florida Bar 2017 question two. Did I get the right one? Question number one. Nope. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry, I'm looking at the the squash one. Okay. Question number two. Sal owns residential real estate. Oh, okay. No. Nope. This nope. Is the, um, the last one you printed. I okay. Think. So it's not you are an attorney working in the Florida Office of Senate Legal Counsel? Um, I'm going to need that no. one second. Okay. Is one. it for the last few years, the downtown area of the city of Metro has yes. been a popular location? Yes, sir. Hey, hey, all right. I'm sorry you don't have a better assistant today, Kaylee. Sorry about that. I feel that. like it's uh, Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> we picked the winner. <laughs> we picked the winner. I don't know who's Pat Sajak and who's Vanna White, but I'm doing my best. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm not doing better, Miss Stouse. Mm -hmm. This is great. Okay, so this essay right here is the 2017 Florida Bar um, question. 2017 was a unique year. It had a con law essay in the spring, or I should say the winter, the February bar exam, and the July bar exam. So as you can see, this essay is an exact question. There's no better way to practice than how you're actually going to play, which is with the actual test. So I would highly recommend going over these essays and you've got 20 years worth. You've got plenty of plenty of options. Reviewing them and seeing what is expected of you. This remind just want to remind you that these essays are not perfect because they are student model answers. And this is the absolute best essay that the bar has given. So or they have selected. So that means that this is the absolute one, best one that they wanted to get share with all of us. But think of all the other attorneys that maybe wrote. A little bit lesser of an essay than this and they still pass so if you don't get every issue that's in this essay do not worry about it because it still could be a passing essay it's just meant to be a guideline so this essay um professor mcginley can you just move it down just a little bit more for me yeah so we're just going to read along really quick thank you sir sure i'm going to read along with you and i'm going to show you how they like to repeat these different bar topics so it says right here, for the last few years, the downtown area of the city of Metro has been a popular location for juveniles to congregate, especially during late evening and early morning hours. Over the past six, excuse me, the prior six months, Metro experienced a significant increase in residential and commercial burglaries in its downtown areas, and a large percentage of the individuals who were arrested for these crimes were juveniles. Ann, who is a mayor of Metro and a member of the Metro City Council, asked Bob, a member of the Metro City Council, to a social gathering at her house to celebrate her son's high school graduation. During this event, Ann took Bob aside and privately mentioned to him that she was concerned about the recent downtown crime activity. So right off the bat, when you read that issue, you see a public official that is in charge, their mayor, discussing with another public official a uh, concern a uh, matter concerning public um, government and a government issue in a private place. So automatically when you see that issue, you should think to yourself, this is a sunshine issue, this is a Florida public meetings issue, 
and this meeting should not be taking place. Because I, I'm not sure, Professor McGinley, if you guys have covered this or not yet, but whenever um, whenever public officials meet, it has to be in public, the public has to be notified and given an opportunity to attend. But when you read that issue, automatically it should pop up in your mind, hey, that's a public meetings issue. Um, Professor McGinley, if you could get that other essay from 2019 for me really quick. You got it. Thank you. Morning session 2019. Perfect. I think that's the tattoo, the pat a paw. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And I've got it right here on my screen too, so I'm reading it from here. So this is another episode, another essay that was, I should say another episode. It's like a TV show with the bar exam. <laughs> the next, the July 2019 episode of the Florida Bar Exam, there was another Florida Con Law issue. And I'm going to look to the um, second paragraph in this where it says, Senator Smith provides you with some background information about Patapa. She recently hosted a private social gathering at her house, and the invitees included Senators Jones and Harris. During this event, Senator Smith took Senators Jones and Harris aside for a private conversation and told them there had been a significant increase in the licensure of tattoo establishments and body piercing salons in Florida. So once more, we see not even two years later, the bar examiners testing very similar fact pattern. Instead of the mayor and the city council members, you see a senator and other senators, once again, at a private event, discussing laws and government issues that the public of Florida has a right to um, be involved in. They have a right to hear this. They have a right to attend these meetings. And it's not even two years later, like I said, and they're testing the same issue. So what this shows you is there's patterns in um, in essays that you'll see. And these two are just the most recent recent examples. There's one leading back to the early 2000s that is discussing similar issues. So as you're reading these issues, you should already recognize based off practicing where you to have another essay that discusses these issues. Hey, I saw a, a public official. I see a public official in a private meeting place. Uh, I see other public officials discussing government business with them in these situations. And right off the bat, you should type into your, your little doom box, your evil essay box, hey, this is a sunshine law or a public needs issue. And you can just go through these essays and pick out these issues based off just seeing them in the past. It's not going to be the exact pattern, the fact pattern. The 2017 essay we just saw was talking about juvenile crime. The 2019 um, essay was talking about piercings and tattoo parlors. These are two different facts, but it's the same exact issues, the same exact rules that you could already have memorized to type out and then discuss with the similar fact patterns. So it's very important for you to go back, review these essays, and then make sure you're spotting these issues on your own and without looking at the model answers. Because if you can't do that leading up to the bar, you're not going to be able to do that in the bar. So you've got to make sure that you're prepared, you know what to write out, and you have something to write out. The worst thing that you can do when you go into the bar is get in there and not know what to write about. Chances are you're going to get in there and you're going to have too much to write about. You're going to be stressed out because you don't have enough time to write about everything you want to. You want to make sure that's that's the problem. It's not having enough time to write everything. You don't want to be sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, there's not enough to write about because then there's no problem. Having those lists that I just had Professor McGinley show you, it helps you get a pre-made outline so that you have issues to write about. The um, the Sunshine Law, that falls under Florida Specials. The 2017 issue um, essay talks about um, juveniles. I think their cell phones getting spied on. You see those issues, you think automatically off the bat, Fourth Amendment issues. So you should start listing the different requirements and the different issues for Fourth Amendment searches and secures. Um, so all of those different things are pre-outlined essays that you can have memorized um, when you're getting ready to write. 
Um, so what we're going to do next is, Professor McGinley, I'm going to have you pull up that first one, the City of Metro, and we'll go through it. Um, okay, City of Metro coming up. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Pretty sure you you have a sample essay. I think it's the Police House Hopes that you gave us. Maybe that was so. similar with a with a um, statue. I lost my City of Metro. Bear with me. Yeah, that's okay. okay. I know I had that. Here it is. Sorry, oh, gosh. It was the one on top. Who could find the one on top, right? That's the hardest one to find. Okay. Perfect. Now, my homeless, you can read it or so they can read it or or just you so you can so hide can my mug it. because who I wants to look my, at me? Mine are right here. Perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. So as we go through this essay, we're going to pick it apart line by line <laughs> because every um, every sentence, most every sentence, has an issue that we can spot. So we're going to take this line by line, and then we're going to spot our issues, and we're going to write them out. So the first, um, actually what we'll do is, Professor McGinley, I'm just going to let you hold it up for a second. I'm okay. going to for like five minutes just to read it through that. And um, Okay. You And also, guys, if you Google um, Florida Bar July 2017, um, you can pull up a copy of this on um, on your computer as well. But what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you read this, and please, if you could, just write down issues that you spot, and we will talk about them as we go along. Hopefully your arm doesn't get too tired, Professor McGill. Hey, no. Are you giving a, my voice box a nice break? So that's okay. My arm can do some of the work. Okay. Yeah. For the last few years, the downtown area of City of Metro has been a popular location for juveniles to congregate, especially during late evening and early morning hours. Over the prior six months, Metro experienced a significant increase in residential commercial burglaries in its downtown area, and a large percentage of the individuals who were arrested for these crimes were juveniles. And who is mayor of Metro and a member of the Metro City Council asked Bob a member of the Metro City Council, to a social gathering at her house to celebrate her son's high school graduation. During this event, Anne took Bob aside and privately mentioned to him that she was concerned about the recent downtown crime activity. Anne and Bob then excused themselves from the graduation celebration and privately discussed the matter. During this discussion, Anne and Bob agreed that the crimes were likely to result likely the result of too many juveniles congregating in the downtown area with nothing to do, and this situation could improve with the imposition of a curfew on juveniles who gather in the downtown area. The following day, Bob instructed city council staff to prepare a draft of a new juvenile curfew ordinance for ratification at the upcoming city council meeting. During the next duly noticed city council meeting, staff presented the new juvenile curfew ordinance to the city council members. The legislative findings of this proposed ordinance read, one, the city of Metro hereby finds and determines, as a matter of fact, that the city of Metro's downtown area remains faced with an unacceptable level of crime caused by juveniles, which threatens its peaceful residents, visitors, and its businesses, too. The city of Metro finds that fighting crime effectively requires an effort to focus on those age groups that are committing or that are susceptible to being induced into committing such crime. Consequently, it is the intent of the city of Metro to create and implement a juvenile curfew ordinance aimed at reducing juvenile crime and the direct and indirect consequences thereof. The proposed ordinance made it unlawful for persons under the age of 17 any premise in the downtown hour at 11 a.m. and 6 a.m. and a fine was assessed for violating this ordinance. During the public comment portion of the city council meeting, many Metro residents objected to this proposed ordinance, including many juveniles who stated that they like to hang out in the downtown area between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Many of these juveniles who said they would spread the word among other juveniles and may even organize demonstrations and do other stuff. Kathy, a Metro resident, stated that she did not support the proposed ordinance and as written, it was likely unlawful. Kathy operates a youth center in the downtown area that is open until 1 a.m. After this feedback, the city council members collectively agreed to table a vote on the ordinance until the next scheduled meeting. Anne sought advice from Dan, a senior partner at your law firm. Anne explained to Dan the circumstances led to the idea of the juvenile curfew, 
including her conversation with Bob at her home, and also expressed concern regarding the legality of the ordinance based on Kathy's comments during the last city council meeting, and also stated to Dan that she is concerned that the juveniles who congregate in the downtown area are planning something. And she wanted to know whether she could direct the Metro Police Department to intercept and listen to their wireless cell phone communications to see what they are up to. And provided Dan with a copy of the proposed ordinance and the minutes of the last city council meeting. Upon reading the minutes, Dan realized that he had recently represented Kathy in transactions involving the operation of her youth center in downtown Metro. Dan asks you to prepare a memorandum that discusses the legality of Ann's actions and the proposed juvenile curfew ordinance under the Florida Constitution. Dan advises that your memorandum should include suggestions for strategies of how to revise the legislative findings of the proposed ordinance so that it passes constitutional muster. Dan also asks you to address whether his prior representation of Kathy presents any issues associated with the representation of Ann. Ms. Stouse, how am I supposed to pass the Florida Bar Exam when I don't even have enough time to read it in the time allowed? This yeah. is this is this is one it's, this is one question. Huh? <laughs> this is one question. There was yeah. more than just this, uh, right? And um, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to write or not, but just following along, Professor McGinley reading the essay, I wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I wrote at least eleven issues that I saw, and that's those are big issues that some of them might have sub issues. And well, I saw standing. Um, whether or not, I think it's the juvenile center that wants to bring suit. You would, of course, talk, discuss standing, whether or not it's right, whether or not they've had an injury. The whole analysis for standing could be discussed. Another issue that we saw was freedom of assembly. We saw sunshine laws that I discussed early, the Fourth Amendment, Florida's ex explicit right to privacy. That's something that Florida is very unique with, and they're very adamant that you know that we are unique and that we have a constitutional right to privacy expressed. Um, the actual language of the statute, there's overbreadth. There's no examples of exceptions. For example, if the kids are going to work or if there was a parent, it just says if the kids are out after hours, you're in trouble. You're, you're going to be dealing with the law. Um, police powers, equal protection, the First Amendment issue. So these are all, es all issues that you can spot in an essay. So as you're writing these issues, um, there's a format that I particularly use, and this is the format that I use with my bar prep company. Um, it's, the issue is whether, and every paragraph can start with that. So that's your I for your issue, and then your your rule, so that's your R for your I, your analysis. You always start your analysis with here. So you have the issue is whether, the rule, here and then you're for your conclusion you have therefore and then you conclude your statement so for example um with the sunshine laws you could write and sorry i don't have this up on the screen but how you would format this would be the issue is whether there has been a violation of florida's public meetings act or sunshine laws with the mayor's um with the mayor's meeting so very short one one sentence issue and you're going to go next to your rules. And these are those pre-memorized rules that you have. You would say Florida has sunshine laws. Florida has public meeting laws that require the public to have access to public meetings, to attend them, to have notice. And you write out those two or three sentences for that rule here. And that's where you're going to do your analysis. Here it is likely that, I believe, the mayor, what was her name? Anne? Anne, yes. Anne. Here... The mayor and it was likely in violation of the sunshine laws because she met with these other city council members and was discussing public business and then you would say this is just public business and this is a violation of sunshine laws because florida citizens have a right to attend these meetings and she was violating this because of this this and this and then once that's done you would close it up with therefore and was it, or the mayor was in violation of Florida Sunshine Laws. So every issue that you have, it should be the issues, whether the rule here, and then your analysis, tie it together with the rule and the facts, and then you conclude it with therefore, and then your, your um, conclusion. So each one of these subtopics should be one of those very short paragraphs. 
And um, I recommend, based off of um, what I've done and then what I've been doing with my bar prep company, is uh, spreading these paragraphs apart and making them easy to read. Um, nobody likes to read just a giant, giant block of text. You want it to be nice and easy, aesthetically pleasing. Um, you're going to see these nice chopped up blocks. And you might think, why, why do I have so many line breaks? Why do I have so many spaces in between um, each paragraph? That's okay. This is not your everyday writing. This is the bar exam writing. You want to make it clear and concise for your bar examiners to read. So you have your issue statement. I do a line break. You have your rule. I do a line break. You have your analysis, a line break, and then your conclusion, a line break. Then move on to your next your next topic so you have these little short cut up little um short little cut up paragraphs but they're really nice because one you can have your points broken out for the bar examiner so when they're grading it they can say oh here's their issue that they spotted there's a point you have your rules it's almost foolproof when they're grading it here's your rules there's points for those check check there's some more points your analysis they've got your your analysis right there more points and your conclusion so you have it laid out for them so it's easier for them to grade, easier to get your points, and they're less likely to forget something when they're grading. Um, another thing that I like to do whenever I'm doing my essays is I like to make headings and then underline um, important, important words. So for each topic, um, I like to do a little subtitle before I start writing. So for our example that we've been using, the sunshine laws, I would bullet and underline sunshine laws and then go into my issues whether my little eye rack. In my actual essay, I highlight or bold or underline um, whichever it is, whatever you choose. Um, I, I, I underline my important words. So, for example, in my rule, if it's sunshine laws, I would underline it. And then the requirements is the notice and the ability to attend. I would underline those key words so that those bar examiners, after staring at 50 essays that are all the exact same, say, hey, look, this person has these, these rules. They have these important points in here, and they'll mark them off because you can't help it. Your eyes are automatically going to go to those, um, those highlighted or accented words. So keep that in mind. Can I ask a question? Year. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, well, I wanted to ask a question about this issue, rule, uh, application, conclusion. So I got yes, there's four parts, and I got four questions, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So first of all, issue. Uh, you've helped me prepare. I've taken the subject matter. I've broken it into its relevant issue parts. Mm -hmm. Do, am I hearing you right? Are you suggesting to me that I, I have my issues in mind? and I'm forcing them into the fact pattern, so to speak. In other words, uh, I'm reading with a purpose. I'm reading, looking for these issues. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, kind of. So okay. as, you're reading the, um, as you're reading the essay, mm. and you spot one of those issues, you should realize that those other similar issues will be there. Ah, and okay. you, it will help you realize like the related topics. Oh, okay. So All right. you don't forget something, for, for example, if um, you're doing the standing, you know that you have to talk about the ripeness, the mootness, the concrete and particular injury, you see that issue and you will know to write those other issues in there so you don't omit them. Yeah. If okay. That makes sense. That does make sense. Thank you. That And okay. that was my first question. My second question yes, had to go with, with the IRAC, had to go with the R, the rule. So now what exactly do I want to write on the bar exam, am I trying to give uh, what they sometimes call black letter law? Am I trying to regurgitate a statute? Am I trying to quote a phrase from the Constitution? Am I trying to give the holding of a case? When I state the rule, help me maybe with an example yeah. to understand Absolutely. what you mean by that. Absolutely. So the rule is the black letter law. Okay. Um, and you can get those rules from the statute. You can get them from that, and that's more difficult to do because not everyone's going to memorize the exact um, statute. But what I did for mine, and what like the bar prep companies give you, is the rules from past essays or from the bar prep companies. 
So you don't have to have citations unless you want to. If you can remember a case name or a statute number, that's incredible. But um, you don't have to have citations. You just need the black letter law. So for our, for example, our sunshine laws, um, Florida's, Florida provides broad sunshine laws that allow access to public meetings. The public has a right to know the meeting, attend the meeting, and um, basically attend and be there and listen. So that would be the law for that particular um, for the particular rule. And then once you sometimes it's like a broader topic, like a broader issue, and there's two or three more. Um, sentences that could be sub rules in that you would include those as well okay all right thank that you makes sense? I, I can picture it better now yeah and i i, yes, I kind of i can visualize it thank you so that that was my second question issue rule application my third question had to do with that uh letter a their application and um yes, sir. how do i phrase this without offending any student anywhere um in in my years of grading essay exams written by law students, mm -hmm. sometimes I wonder why they've spent so much time copying and pasting the fact pattern, why they've spent their precious essay time, exam time, simply rewriting what the question said. So my question about application is this. Mm -hmm. I loved your advice, starting with here, you know, because that clues me off that here's the application. But yes, sir. to what extent, after the word here, should I retype and regurgitate what's already on the exam page when it comes to the fact pattern? That's a great question. So you don't want to copy and paste the facts verbatim. You just Thanks. Want those key words. It, and, and that's really, that's a tough thing about analysis. That's one of the hardest things to grasp when in legal writing is, where, where the fine line is between too many facts versus the analysis. Yeah. So all you want to do is get the key pieces of information. So with our example on the mayor, we see the mayor going to, or having a graduation party for her son. We see these other city council members there and we see her meeting with the officer, the other um, city council members talking about government business. That's a lot of information, and it all is relevant, but you don't want to include every last one of those details in your analysis. Thank you. So what, yeah, you don't want to do that. It's, <laughs> it's not the professor knows what the facts are. He wrote the example. <laughs> wrote the question. That you can dissect those important pieces of information. So for this particular question, what I would probably pull out of that would be here, we likely see a violation of the public meeting rules because Carol is meeting with other city council members in private. I like the because this, phrase. I like that. Yes, or, or when this happened. or Yes. And yeah. those are those key analysis, analysis um, requirements that you need. You need to say why this is applicable to the rule. What happened to affect this fact pattern? Why is this outcome this way? Mm -hmm. So for our example that we've been using, when Carol met with the um, other city council member, she was in violation of meetings because she was doing it in private. Two or more city council members were present, and the public wasn't put on notice and wasn't given an opportunity to I like attend. That. I like so, what you did just there because you gave me not a regurgitation of the facts, but a summary of the facts in such a way that it illustrated to me the relevance of the facts. Yes, so, many, so many and times when I'm grading an essay and it's so close to what I wrote in the question or it's verbatim from what I wrote in the question, how do I, in fairness, give points to that essay under the guise of analysis? Is that analysis to simply quote me back to me, so to speak? So that's why I love the example you just gave there where you restated the facts, but you restated in such a way that you analyze the facts by which I mean you highlighted the relevance, the importance of those facts to the particular rule that you cited under that issue. And that's what Love that's it. what the bar examiners are trying to test because when you have a client come into your office, they're not going to give you, this is, they're, they're not attorneys. They don't know that it matters that Carol met in private, that, or not Carol, that, um, Anne, is it Anne? That Anne. Anne was the mayor. Okay, the mayor. They don't care that 
the, the, your client's not going to know that Anne Samaria, she met with two or more people and that's a violation of the sunshine laws. You're going to have a client that's going to come give you that giant story that yeah. in the question. Yep. In the bar example. And you and I saw it all the time when we would meet with clients together. Yes. Yeah. Um, exactly. And we get those fact patterns and the bar examiners want to make sure that you can pull out of the story the relevant pieces of information that are legal arguments that you can use to defend your client. So they don't want the whole story. They just want the important relevant facts. And that's what the key, the key goal of that analysis is. Thanks. Pull that, out those couple words. That answers my third question. I just got that fourth question. It has to do with the fourth letter in IRAC. Uh, yes, sir. has to do with conclusion. And Ms. Stouse, I got to admit, in asking you this question, I do not know the answer. I do not know the answer insofar as it comes to bar examiners who are grading bar mm -hmm. exams. But I'm mm -hmm. wondering, to what extent are bar examiners who are grading bar exams looking for the correct answer? Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is, you know, I give essay questions and I want a conclusion and I'm going to grade that conclusion based on whether or not it is an eligible conclusion that arises under this issue based on that rule and this analysis. But me, when I grade an essay, I don't grade for right or wrong when it comes to the conclusion. I'm giving equal points to the conclusion I agree with and the conclusion I disagree with. So long as those two conclusions are both eligible conclusions that arise under this issue and that our proper application of the rule to these facts. Now that's me. What about the bar examiners? What are they looking for? Is it black and white? Is it right or wrong? Is it up and down? Is it square or circle? I believe it's just like what you said. It's the okay. bar examiners. They're wanting to see that you can support your position. Okay. Because as we see in our case right here, we have the mayor versus, I think, the juvenile center. These are two sides. And as an attorney, you have to be able to represent both sides, yeah. regardless of who might be right or wrong. So as long as you can support that argument with your analysis and you arrive at a logical conclusion because of your analysis, that's what they're looking for, is that you can pull these facts, make your analysis, and then make a conclusion based off of it. Okay. Um, so, the, so the bar examiners are like me then? Yes, sir. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And um, the conclusion sentence isn't long. It doesn't need to be a restatement of the facts. It doesn't need to be a restatement of the analysis. It's just, therefore, this is your conclusion. So for our example with the Sunshine Laws, it would be, therefore, Anne was in violation of the Florida Sunshine Laws. And then call it a day. It's not long. It's not repeating everything that you had that you've previously stated. It's just your conclusion that you've come to and then you move on. And that's another issue that people have is they don't know how to, they don't, they don't see that you can be brief and still get your point. They think you have to elaborate on that conclusion again, or you have to elaborate on that issue statement. Those aren't the places where you're going to score your big points. You're going to score your big points on your analysis and your rules. So you want to make sure that you balance the proper areas of where to um, focus on. Yeah. That makes sense. That does. That makes sense. Okay. So we talked about that essay. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit more about preparing for the actual um, exam. Um, it's very important that you practice writing these essays very frequently. There shouldn't be uh, more than two days that go by during your bar prep studies where you're not reviewing an essay or issue spotting an essay. And what I mean by that is it doesn't mean that you have to sit down and read through it and write out a full 1,500-word essay for that question. But you do need to be able to go through it just like how we did a little bit ago in that when you're reading through it, you can read through these different types of fact patterns and you can spot out seven or eight issues at least. And then you can, in your head, you can type them out. You can write some of those rules for each of those issues. And that way it makes sure that you're, it's fresh in your mind, the issues that you're going to be writing about and that you're still able to go over um, the different topics. Um, I was super, I always say this, uh, I, there's two days before the exam and my bar prep tutor gave me an essay um, for 
the, that Florida comp, it was the 2017 one that we just went over. She gave that to me two days before the bar exam. And she's like, here, your last party gift, go through this and issue spot. <laughs> and I looked at that essay and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I don't know all of these different rules for these this particular essay. And it freaked me out because I think to myself, oh my gosh, I don't know these as well as I do, as I thought I did. Um, and because that was one of those essays that I had gone over towards the beginning of the summer. And there's just so much different stuff that you're going on, going over. And um, that, in hindsight, that's something I wish I would have done even more of, was just rotate through those essays more. But she gives me this essay and says, look at this, go over it. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that was terrible. I had, some, I had a tough time reviewing that essay. And I went back, and that entire night, I just thought about that entire Florida Conroe essay. I went over all those issues and stuff. We um, went over the different issues, and then I, I felt better about it. And then two days later, that um, that was the exact question that was on the bar. So <laughs> that was that was Jesus helping me out. Amen. Right there. And, uh, <laughs> I was so grateful for that. But with that being said, like I don't want any of you guys to have that apprehension two days before the bar. I want you guys to have gone over these essays so many times where it's second nature. Boom, 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 here's your essay, move on. Um, you will get essays that you get caught up on. You will get essays that are really tough and you think, oh my gosh, I could never answer this if it came on the bar. That's okay, that's the whole point of preparation is the more essay topics that you see, the less likely it is going to be a surprise for you on the exam. And if you do get a surprise on the exam, that is okay because everybody else is <laughs> easy for you to say. Well. So, um, the Floyd Bar is notorious for um, throwing in surprises. Um, last thing I would recommend to you guys is getting a set schedule and staying on that schedule throughout the summer. Um, whether it's down to the simplest things of waking up, going to bed, when you're taking your break, what you're going to do, and setting out your plan for the day. Um, that's very important because all, all. So, of the, so is it kind of like being quarantined? I was just gonna say. <laughs> um, Did I steal your punchline? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, I, I actually um, posted that on my on my book um, Twitter that being quarantined is kind of like bar prep. You lock yourself away for a couple months and then it pays off in the end. <laughs> and, it, and it's so true. This is this what you're experiencing right now. Quarantine is just like bar prep. But instead of being afraid to go outside because um, you're feeling the bar, you're afraid of catching an illness. So um, make sure that you get on that routine and you stick to it because the mindless things of day-to-day -day life like eating and going to the gym and waking up, like that should all be second nature so that you can focus on the important, the important material that you're going to be learning. And there's so much material for the bar. You're not going to learn everything. It's just getting a grasp and getting a well enough understanding of each of those issues so that you can talk a little bit about them. Um, I think that's it for me. I'm just going to look. Oh, one more thing. I'm so sorry. I know I said that. Um, another tool that I used that was very beneficial when I was going through my essays was the website Quizlet. I know that some of the professors have shown, had shown us that during bar prep, but I made Quizlet, um, flashcards with the topics for the past 20 years. So anytime I would go through an essay and spot on an issue, I would make, I would take that rule and put it into quiz split. So every night before bed, I would flip through 15, 20 of the Florida, Florida essay topic rules. And that way I would have a refresher from those as well. So no wonder you passed. I know. I, <laughs> I, I literally, I feel so blessed. I couldn't tell you what I wrote down, but I could have, I could have failed by a good 20 points and still been and still uh, on the MD and I still could have passed because of the Florida portion. Wow. I did right. very well on that portion and I think good. it was because of the organization and um, I know kind of Barry gets kind of a bad name sometimes and not having the best bar prep rate but last year our bar prep rate went up. Um, our school had incredible bar prep teachers, the bar essay, the bar survey classes. They're very useful tools. And they're making the effort. All you guys have to do is just use the tools that are given to you, study, crack down for a couple of months, and I have no doubt in my mind and that you guys will pass and bring up that bar prep rate again. Yeah. All yeah. right. I think that's, that's it, awesome. Professor McGinley. Hey, thank you very questions? much. 
Yeah, you know, I don't really have that that back and forth. We got the little screen here where things are typed. So oh, anyone okay. who wants to type you a question, you can type them in really quick. Okay. Yeah, and you were great about that earlier. You saw someone type a question and you commented on it. Usually, I'm running my mouth so fast I never really get a chance to read over there. So yeah, now's the time. Anyone who wants to type a question, I'll read it out loud, and Miss Stouse can can answer it for us. And of course, uh, she doesn't see this coming. This this was not her idea, but I wanted to plug her book, which is a fantastic oh. book, <laughs> Beating the Law School Curve, A Blueprint to 1L Success. Uh, of course, you're not a 1L anymore, but the advice in this book is invaluable, whether you're a 1L, 2L, 3L, or even if you call yourself a 4L. <laughs> and if you've yes, got a sir, friend, I, if you've got a friend who's a 1L, this book is certainly one that they need. You can buy this uh, wherever fine books are sold, including Amazon.com and many other websites. So yes, sir. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, Thank no, this this book, this is great. So yeah. Yes, sir. And I'll put my email address down there on um, on the little chat as well. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'd be glad to help you all. And I hope you all stay safe and healthy. And thank you, Professor McGinley, for having me today. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, your insight is invaluable. Uh, your perspective is is both unique and needed. So thank you for taking the time. I, I know I speak for everybody when I say thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's not a problem. It's so good yeah. to see you, sir. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. All right. Well, class, this is a perfect time to take our break. We're going to do about nine minutes. And I'll uh, point you at the, at the books of the library. I don't know. There you go. There's a sight to see. Okay. And I will be back in 10 minutes. 10 fingers. 10 minutes. All right. Thank you. Oops. Oh. Are you still there? Oh, there you go. You were awesome. <laughs>
Well, welcome back. Hope the break wasn't too long. I know we started a few minutes late, but don't you worry. We're getting you out of here on time. So I know I speak for everyone when I thank uh, Miss Kaylee Staus, a uh, fine alumna of your law school, uh, someone you know, we can all be proud of. I thought her information was invaluable, and I hope it proves to be invaluable if you happen to choose to take the Florida bar. But so much of it was transferable to any bar exam. So wherever your future may lead when it comes to taking bar exams, hope that was uh, time well spent. It's good to get ahead of the syllabus like we are. And if we finish just this chapter tonight, elections, we'll still be far enough ahead of the syllabus in order to give you a class that involves a complete review of the entire semester. But I suspect with the time we have left, because the elections chapter is one of those short ones, eight pages, that we'll have plenty of time to do more than just elections. We're also going to start on Homestead, probably get well through Homestead, which again is going to leave us almost two full classes ahead of the syllabus without omitting any of the relevant or important information. So. Hopefully this is a worthwhile class for you, despite the fact that we've had to go virtual because of the, of the pandemic. So that brings us to this chapter. This chapter talks about elections. And I, I opened the, uh, the chapter with, with a loaded question there. I said, is the election process of any state more infamous than Florida's? And of course, my next site after making that loaded statement was to talk about Bush versus Gore. You studied Bush versus Gore in your con law one class, in your federal con law class. So we won't revisit it here other than to note that, quoting from that opinion, seven justices of the Supreme Court of the United States agreed that there are constitutional problems with Florida's election system. The U.S. Supreme Court held that in Florida, a simple recount cannot be conducted in compliance with the requirements of equal protection and due process without substantial additional work. So the question that yields is, has Florida done the substantial additional work in the 20 years since Bush versus Gore? Well, we haven't had another Bush versus Gore exactly like Bush versus Gore's facts were, so one could argue yes. But the point is well made to say that when it comes to elections, we must turn to Florida's constitution because despite each state joining the union, it retained its inherent power to govern its own elections to the extent that those elections determine the outcome of the constitutional officers of that state constitution of that state. So that's why we also open the chapter with a quote from Article 6, Section 1, Regulation of Elections. And there, Florida's Constitution reminds us that all elections by the people shall be direct and secret vote. General elections shall be determined by a plurality of the votes cast. Registration and elections shall, and political party functions may be regulated by law. However, the requirements for a candidate with no party affiliation or for a candidate of a minor party for placement of the candidate's name on the ballot shall be no greater than the requirements for a candidate of the party having the largest number of registered voters. So Florida's constitution in its text by its very terms attempts to protect the rights of smaller parties and in so doing might allow parties to arise in Florida maybe even have more votes, more power, more members than we might see in the nation as a whole. So I'm always looking to compare and contrast when it comes to our state constitution versus the federal constitution. And here we have this direct reference to parties and the rights of political parties. Now, does that mean that this difference in text of the state versus federal constitution has yielded a practical difference? Do we see parties in Florida with great power that are absent from the federal stage? And for the most part, no, we do not. Our Florida House of Representatives, our Florida Senate, for the most part, consists of either Republicans or Democrats. So those two major parties from the national stage remain the national parties here, in the state stage. As you know, as a fellow Floridian, you've seen that. And that brings us to the first case and the only case that we talk about in this very small 
eight page chapter. This was Orange County versus Sane. Rather recent case came out of the Supreme Court of the State of Florida back in 2019. So not quite a year old as I speak to you today. In this rather recent case, what we see here harkens back to some of our earlier studies in this very class when it talked about municipalities, when it talked about counties, when it talked about cities. Also harkens back to our prior studies in this very class when we talked about the executive branch, when we talked about elected officials, when we talked about constitutional officers. We see all of that coming into play here in Orange County versus Sing. So what's going on here in Orange County versus Sing? First, I'm gonna put the procedural part aside, get back to that at the end. This involved recalling a mandate We'll get to that in a minute. So procedurally, let's put a pin in that so we can return to it. Let's first focus on the merits or the subject or the particular issues involved here. What we've got is the Orange County Board of County Commissioners in August 2014. They enact an ordinance, and that ordinance proposes an amendment to the Orange County's charter. As you remember from our prior studies, Orange County, Florida is a charter county. So there's a proposed amendment to the charter. It's going to provide for term limits and it's going to provide for nonpartisan elections for six county constitutional officers. And you remember we talked about these particular offices in prior lectures. Here they're going to put term limits and nonpartisan upon the clerk of circuit court, which you remember when we studied the legislative branch, I pointed out that this was a separately elected constitutional official. Don't be deceived by the title clerk. This is not someone who's hired and fired by the judge. No, this is an elected official who holds a constitutional office. So we're talking about putting term limits in Orange County versus Singh upon the clerk of the circuit court, on, upon the comptroller, upon the property appraiser, upon the sheriff, upon the supervisor of elections, and upon the tax collector. And here's how the ordinance read. They put the following ballot question to be presented for further approval. For the purpose of establishing term limits and nonpartisan elections for the Orange County Clerk of Court, Comptroller, Property Appraiser, Sheriff, Supervisor, Election, and Tax Selector, this amendment provides for county constitutional officers to be elected on a nonpartisan basis, meaning not based upon Democrat or Republican, not based upon party, nonpartisan, and subject to term limits of four consecutive four year terms. Yes or no? That's what was on the ballot for consideration for amending the charter of Orange County. But what we've got here is three of these Orange County constitutional officers, the sheriff, the property appraiser, and the tax collector, they filed a lawsuit. They wanted a declaratory judgment and they wanted injunctive relief against Orange County. They're challenging the underlying county ordinance as well as the ballot title, as well as a summary. So they don't like the idea of running nonpartisan. They don't like the idea of having a term limit. So what is the analysis here? Well, first, the trial court concludes that Orange County is prohibited from regulating nonpartisan elections for county constitutional officers because that subject matter was preempted to Florida's legislature. The preemption is a theme that has run throughout our studies. In our very first lecture, the question was whether federal preempts the state. Later, as we looked at counties and other municipalities, the question became whether the state legislature preempted the local governments. So again, we see a question here. Obviously, there is a statewide statute. There's a Florida election code that governs elections in Florida. The question is, did that Florida election code preempt the attempts we see here by Orange County to propose and ultimately to amend the county charter? So what the trial court concludes is that, yes, preemption was there. The Florida legislature did indeed preempt by enacting the Florida Evidence Code. That trial court judgment went on appeal to Florida's 5th District Court of Appeal. The 5th DCA has territorial jurisdiction over Orange County. It is physically located in Daytona Beach, and it is reviewing on appeal the decision of the trial court. And the fifth affirms, fifth DCA affirms the trial court's judgment. The fifth district court of appeal held that the Florida evidence code expressly preempts the Orange County ordinance requiring non-party elections, 
nonpartisan elections for county constitutional officers. The reasoning of the fifth district was that the legislature regulates elections generally through the Florida election code and enacted the Florida election code that expressly provides that all matters set forth in the Florida election code were preempted to the legislature. So in the opinion of the fifth DCA, they saw this as an issue of express preemption. Now, when we look at the Florida Evidence Code, does it say Orange County? Does it say Orange County Charter? No. But yet the language I just quote to you here, which the 50 CA quotes to us in their opinion, quote, expressly provides that all matters set forth in the Florida Election Code were preempted, quote, to the legislature. That was enough, according to the 50 CA, to result in express preemption. And you remember from our lecture, where our lecture focused upon lawmaking and its limits. One of the limits upon lawmaking we discussed was preemption. And one of the things we discussed was, is that there can be express preemption. And that express preemption, whether or not it's been expressed, is a question of fact to be resolved by the court. So what the court is saying here is, yeah, if I read the Florida evidence, uh, Florida election code, I don't see the word Orange County. I don't see the word Orange County charter, but I'm making a finding of fact that the words I do see constitute express preemption. So this case is talking about election law for sure, but it's also giving us an example of so many of the other things that we've studied in prior lectures in this class. It's one of the reasons I included the case in the book. It's an application of what you've studied already. So now this goes to the Supreme Court of Florida. And this is when I want to grab that pin. When I talk about the procedural issues, I want to grab that now and talk about it. You saw that the case mentioned by saying, uh, the case began by mentioning and saying that respondents joint motion to recall the mandate is hereby granted. What had happened was, and we discussed this period of time in an earlier lecture, three justices of Florida Supreme Court retired at the same time based on Florida's constitution saying that there was a mandatory retirement age. So these three justices before their retirement had issued an opinion in Orange County versus Singh. Specifically, it came out in December as they were leaving, the mandate did. But the mandate was recalled. It was taken back. It was nullified, if you will, by the new justices who then formed a new majority who came to the opposite conclusion of the original justices who had written the original mandate. So the ultimate outcome of Orange County versus Singh became what the new justices said by forming that new majority that didn't exist before the three of them took the bench. And you see that's true at the end of the opinion when you see Justice LaBarga is dissenting. He notes in the prior mandate, this court held that the Florida Election Code does not expressly preempt the home rule authority of Orange County to determine its constitutional officers be elected in a general election without partisan affiliation. I concurred in that decision, says Justice LaBarga, dissenting from this one. And I continue to agree with the analysis and conclusion reached by the earlier majority, which is not the current majority. Accordingly, says Justice LaBarga in his dissent, I dissent from the current majority's holding that the nonpartisan election portion of the Orange County Ordinance is preempted by the Florida Election Code. And I dissent to the decision of the majority to recall the mandate issued in this case. So he Justice LaBarga wouldn't have even recalled the mandate if he had been in the majority, if it therefore had been up to him and his majority, but he was not in the majority. And ultimately, the final opinion of Orange County versus Singh was the same as the 5th DCA, was the same as the trial court, was to say that the Florida Election Code expressly preempts what we saw Orange County was attempting to do there. So this gives us some insight into Florida election law gives us some insight into how it's governed. It's governed by a Florida election code, and it gives us great insight as to how that election code governs not only statewide elections, but local elections, even local elections held 
for constitutional officers who are part of a duly enacted ordinance or here we've got the uh, not just the ordinance, but we've got the, I hate my man, my mind won't give me the word. We're talking about modifying the charter. There's the word I was looking for, charter. It's getting late in the day. Sorry for that delay. But there we're talking about preemption. So this charter and how it is amended is done through elections, but those elections are done according to a statewide Florida election code. So that, in a nutshell, is our case that predominates this particularly short chapter, Orange County versus Singh. We go out uh, with part B that talks about not a case, but electors and disqualification. In Florida election law, an elector is someone who is eligible to vote in an election. That's the definition of elector. Uh, disqualification is something that makes someone ineligible to be an elector or stated somewhat differently, you lose your right to vote. Now, Article 6 of Florida's Constitution says the following about electors and their potential disqualification, and in a very recent amendment affected in 2019, talks about former felons. So Section 2 says every citizen of the U.S. who's at least 18 years of age and who's a permanent resident of the state of Florida, if registered as provided by law, shall be an elector of the county where registered. Section three says each eligible citizen upon registering shall take the following oath. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Florida, and that I am qualified to register as an elector under the Constitution and laws of the state of Florida. Section four talks about those disqualifications. No person convicted of a felony or adjudicated in this or any other state to be mentally incompetent shall be qualified to vote or hold office until restoration of civil rights or removal of the disability. Except as provided in subsection B, any disqualification from voting arising from a felony conviction shall terminate and voting rights shall be restored upon completion of all terms of sentence, including parole or probation. Now look at that language there. That's the language that if you were a voter in 2019 here in the state of Florida, you voted yes for. That's the language you added to Florida's constitution in 2019. You said there that the disqualification from voting terminates and voting rights shall be restored upon completion of all terms. That was your language, electors. All terms of sentences, including parole or probation. So the Florida legislature passed an enabling statute saying that you had to finish your parole, you had to finish your probation, and you had to pay off the court costs that were assessed against you for having committed this crime. And when you did those things, you got your voting rights back despite having been a felony and having served time and completed the service of that time for that felony. Now, litigation ensued over the issue of whether these former felons needed to repay the money before having their civil rights and their right to vote restored to them. And ultimately, so far as we speak today, the outcome of those cases has been that we can't add the additional requirement of paying the money. That's been the outcome of the litigation thus far as you and I speak on this particular date. So no person convicted of murder or a felony sexual offense shall be qualified to vote until restoration of civil rights. So there's a carve out exception, making it harder for those particular felons. No person may appear on the ballot for reelection to any one of the following offices. And the Florida constitution then talks about these particular folks if by the end of the current office, the person will have served or but for resignation would have served in that office for eight consecutive years. But here's the catch. Remember from our prior studies that Florida's constitution itself can be unconstitutional. How can a constitution be unconstitutional? Well, in our federalism system, 
We have state constitutions and we have a federal constitution. Any state law, even if it appears in the state constitution that violates the federal constitution is itself unconstitutional. Therefore, the terms of a state constitution can be unconstitutional under the federal constitution. And that's exactly what has happened here. You note under the notes and questions to consider note one, they attempt to put in term limits. But in a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1995, U.S. Term Limits versus Thornton, 514 U.S. 779, the U.S. Supreme Court considered a similar term limit appearing in the Arkansas Constitution. The court affirmed the Arkansas Supreme Court's ruling that the term limits imposed upon candidates for the United States Congress was a violation of the U.S. Constitution. Specifically, the Supreme Court of the United States held that states cannot impose qualifications upon candidates for the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House of Representatives in addition to those imposed by the U.S. Constitution. So SCOTUS wasn't talking about state Senate, state House of Representatives. SCOTUS was talking about the United States Senate, the United States House of Representatives. The requirements that the United States Constitution imposes upon the United States Senate in the United States House of Representatives, those are the only ones that can apply. If you want term limits upon the U.S. Senator, U.S. House of Representatives, you need to amend the U.S. Constitution. Amending the state constitution is insufficient to impose term limits upon the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House of Representatives. It's got to be the U.S. Constitution that contains that term limit. It does not so by putting that term limit in your state constitution, that state constitution term limit is unconstitutional under the federal constitution. So that was our chapter on elections. And we can still finish on time today by spending about 17 minutes on the topic of homestead. And you know, when you think about it, do we really need to spend all of 17 minutes on homestead? I mean, I bet you I could sum up Homestead in a single slide right there on the big board. I bet you I could do it in one slide. Let's see if I'm right. Here you go. All right, Homestead. Here you are. See, that pretty much sums it up, right? Homestead is a city within Miami Dade County, Florida. Total area is 14.4 square miles. It's about 35 miles southwest of Miami, 25 miles northwest of Key Largo. And its racetrack is the annual finale of the NASCAR Cup Series. So there you go. That's, I think that's all you need to know about Homestead. Am I right? <laughs> Just kidding. All right. What am I talking about when I talk about Homestead? And yes, yes, there is a town in the state of Florida, a municipality by the name of Homestead. I mean, no disrespect to it and its citizens by uh, telling that joke. But when we talk about Florida Homestead under Florida's constitution, we're talking about protection from creditor rights. We're talking about the plain text of our constitution providing greater protection from creditors under the state constitution than we find under the federal constitution. So this would be an example of the laboratory of democracy creating within the state constitution a greater right. So let's take a look at that greater right. Here we've got Article 10, Section 4, Florida's constitution. And as you can see, it says the following. There shall be exempt from forced sale under process of any court, and no judgment, decree, or execution shall be a lien thereon, except for the payment of taxes and assessments thereon, obligations contracted for the purchase, improvement, or repair thereof, or obligations contracted for house, field, or other labor performed on the realty, the following property owned by a natural person. So note already some exceptions, some carve-outs, some places where a debt might arise, but Homestead does not protect the debtor from having to satisfy the creditor. Take a look at that. First, you've got to see payment of taxes. No taxes there? So if I owe taxes, I might lose my house, my homestead, despite the homestead law. I'm not just talking about real estate taxes, I'm talking about any taxes. Another lien that 
homestead won't protect me from, another creditor I got to pay despite the property being my homestead would be obligations contracted for the purchase. A mortgage. Imagine a world where you could take out a mortgage on the house. Million dollar house. So you borrow a million dollars. And you move in. It's beautiful. You declare your homestead. And the mortgage bill arrives. And you say, nah, not paying that one. Took out a 30-year loan. Not paying any of the payments. This is my homestead. I get to keep it for free. Thanks for the free money, bank. That system wouldn't work, would it? No. And that's not what homestead says. So if you take out a mortgage, homestead won't protect you from foreclosure. But wait, there's more. What if you improve the house? What if you add a dormer? What if you screen in the porch? The money you incur in debt for the home improvements. Likewise, they can foreclose. You can't assert homestead to protect yourself from them. What about the handyman fixes the fence? That's an improvement to the realty. The handyman can foreclose. You can't protect yourself from that creditor's lien. So that's built right in here. Assuming it isn't one of those, the next question is, how much property, how much homestead is going to be protected? Let's read on. Florida's homestead law protects one. A homestead, if located outside a municipality, to the extent of 160 acres of contiguous land and improvements thereon, which shall not be reduced without the owner's consent by reason of subsequent inclusion in a municipality, or if located within a municipality, to the extent of one half acre of contiguous land, upon which exception shall be limited to the residence of the owner or the owner's family. So look at the difference. The difference is, am I time I make this my homestead inside a municipality is that an incorporated area. You remember we talked about municipalities, we talked about incorporation. Here's where it's relevant under homestead. At the time you settle the homestead, make it your homestead. If it's outside a municipality, then this rule applies. Even if later that land is annexed into a municipality or incorporates itself into municipality, still it's the time instead of the homestead. If that's unincorporated, then you've got 160 acres. You've got a lot less if you're inside a municipality. If you're inside a municipality at the time that you settle the homestead, you get one half acre. In either case, we're talking about contiguous land. And what do we mean? We mean land that is touching. It's contiguous. It doesn't have to be wholly contiguous. It might be a serpentine pattern. It might be a large square here and a smaller square there. As long as they touch, as long as they're contiguous, as long as you can literally walk without leaving the property boundary, then you've got contiguous. And that's what's going to be protected. Also, this is of lesser importance because of the dollar amounts, but it's not to be forgotten. We're also going to protect personal property to the value of $1,000. And that's in addition to the real property. That's part of the homestead protection from creditors too. These exceptions shall inure to the surviving spouse or heirs of the owner. And not today, but in our next lecture, as we continue our studies of homestead, we're going to look at specific heirs. And the case law is going to clarify to us whether or not they receive the benefit of homestead. Spoiler alert, almost invariably, the answer is yes. We'll cover the details when we look at the case law. So when is Florida Realty a homestead? And here's the four factors you need to know. They come from a 1980s decision of Florida Supreme Court called N. Ray Cook. So here's what you're looking for. Florida Realty is a homestead when it's, one, owned by a natural person. What's that mean? It means flesh and blood. It also means revocable living trusts if the terms of the revocable living trust say so. So natural person includes flesh and blood, includes revocable living trust that preserves the homestead. 
What does it not include? Does not include an LLC, does not include a corporation, does not include an unincorporated partnership. Number two, Florida Realty is a homestead when it owned by a natural person, number two, who intends it to be his or her permanent residence. Who is it that has to intend it? The person seeking the benefit of the homestead, the, per the homesteader, the person who owns it. It's a subjective inquiry into that homesteader, that natural person, that individual's state of mind. Let's look at number three. Florida Realty is a homestead when it's owned by a natural person who intends it to be his or her permanent residence. Number three, and who is a legal owner of the real property. Ah, McGinley, I took property one. I was indoctrinated to believe that property is a bundle of sticks. And the question is, which sticks do I have to own? When it comes to homestead, I don't need very many sticks at all. In our next lecture, we'll not only look at some case law precedent that helps us better understand Homestead, we'll also be looking at the writings of my good buddy, Joe Percopo. Joe practices right here in Orange County. The man is brilliant. I quoted liberally, with his permission, from his Florida Bar Journal articles. If you want to protect your assets, Joe knows how, and he'll tell you which bundles of the stick you need to hold in order to be a legal owner of the real property. We'll go over it in greater detail next class. Spoiler alert. Very few bundles, very few parts, very little requirement there. What's the fourth part? Florida Realty is a homestead when it's owned by a natural person who intends it to be his or her own permanent residence and who's a legal owner of the real property. And four, the real property meets the size and contiguity requirements of Florida's constitution which we just discussed in our prior slide. So those are the four things that tell us whether or not it's a homestead. Let's answer this part of the question. What if a homestead is jointly owned? Nowadays, this is very common. Many of us have spouses. What do you call it when a, both spouses own an undivided one half interest? That's called tenancy by the entireties. Remember that phrase? So let's take a look. What if the homestead is jointly owned? Can it still be protected from creditors under homestead? We're looking at chapter 732 of Florida statutes. It provides that a homestead jointly owned via tenancy by the entireties or via joint tenancy with rights of survivorship becomes solely owned by the surviving owner upon the co-owner's death and does so free and clear of the deceased's debts and financial obligations except taxes and liens for purchases or improvements to the property. So do you see how that works? Two co-owners, perhaps they're spouses, so it's a tenancy by the entirety, or perhaps they're unmarried co-owners with a proper deed might still become joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Say these two co-owners have a mortgage and one of them dies. Does the other one jump for joy because they never have to make a mortgage payment again? No. The mortgage still has to be paid because if it's not paid, the house can be lost to foreclosure because neither the common law homestead that we find in the text of Florida's constitution, nor the enabling statute that we find in Florida statute chapter 732 is going to protect the homestead from foreclosure by a purchase money mortgage holder. Still got to pay the bank. We're still not giving away free houses under Florida's constitution. Let's look at the next slide. What is meant by Florida's constitution saying that homestead cannot be devised. Remember we read that when we read the text of Florida's constitution a few slides ago. What's meant by that? Well, it means three things. Here's the first thing that it means. The deceased's will or the deceased's revocable living trust or whatever it is that the deceased is using as the deceased's legally binding estate plan 
that does not void or avoid homestead protection when there is a surviving child or spouse of the deceased because it does not control the devise of the homestead when there are such survivors. We know that from Florida Statute sec Section 732.4015. That's the first of three things that it means. What's the second thing that is meant by the Florida Constitution saying that homestead cannot be div devised? The second thing it means is that the surviving spouse is going to inherit, despite any will, trust, or estate plan to the contrary, one of these two things, either A or B. The surviving spouse is either going to get A, choice of a life estate or an undivided one-half interest if the deceased children survive the deceased, and the deceased children, in turn, per serpes, hold a vested remainder. Is some of your property law one coming back to you? You're going to need it to understand how property law is affected by Florida's homestead. So the surviving spouse is going to get either A or B. That's A. Let's look at B. If the deceased's children did not survive the deceased, so in other words, the deceased at the time of death had no living children, then the spouse inherits the homestead and be simple. What's the exception? If the spouse waived that right. How do we know whether the spouse waived that right? It has to be done formally in a deed. Indeed, the language of the deed appears in Florida Statutes chapter 762. That's the language you're looking for. Signed, filed, in a deed. Then you know for sure there was a waiver. Otherwise, you can't be certain. And the waiver is disfavored. So if you're a practitioner, you want to get the waiver right, open the statute, copy and paste the language into the deed, which is then signed sealed for the notary and the two witnesses and all the required formalities and then is filed in the county that holds the land records. The county that you need is the county where the land is located in the state of Florida. File that deed there. Pay the doc stamps. <laughs> then you've got an effective waiver. What is meant by Florida's constitution saying the homestead cannot be devised? We looked at points one and two. Here's number three, the third thing it means. It means that despite the will, the trust, the estate plan, the surviving children of the deceased inherit, if there's no surviving spouse, they inherit the homestead in fee simple as tenants in common. Oh, but brother and sister have been fighting since they were infants and they're continuing to fight today. Does that mean we give half the home to one brother or sister and half the home to the other sibling? No. We give an undivided interest. They own it collectively, the surviving children, in fee simple, as tenants in common. But they fight. They have nothing in common. Well, they have one thing in common. They have the homestead. <laughs> Maybe they don't want to physically live there, but they have the right to do so. So that's what that means. What becomes the homestead? And I promise I'll get you out of here in about two minutes. What becomes the homestead if the deceased is not survived by a spouse or children? Homestead protection is lost unless the deceased estate plan divides the homestead solely to one or more of the deceased family members who fall within the class of persons categorized in 732-103 Florida statute, which is Florida's intestacy statute. But the challenge is, can anyone conjure somebody who doesn't fall within that list. Look at the list. We'll start next week with looking at that list. And you'll see, spoiler alert, that it includes most anybody and everybody. It's very hard in practice to say that the homestead has been lost because there's a survivor who is inheriting that is not on Florida's list of intestacy 
that you find in section 732.103 Florida statutes. So what will we cover in our next class? We'll be covering Homestead. Will we end there? No, we won't. We'll move on to the tax chapter after that. And if you've found my lectures less than exciting until now, wait till I cover tax. I'm oh, sorry, I was starting to fall asleep just thinking about covering tax. No disrespect, man, to the fellow tax practitioners out there, future tax practitioners. Anyway, I had a great time standing here alone talking to this webcam. <laughs> Hopefully, I did more than just talk to myself. Hopefully, I gave you good education. That's certainly my goal. Keep the comments coming. However I can help you, however I can approve, I certainly want to do that. I want you to have the very best education you can so you can go out there and be the very best lawyer you can. You can do the Lord's work and make this world a better place. Until next week, my wife Bernadette and I will continue to keep all of you in our prayers. If you're the type to pray, please pray for us. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Thank you for your attention today. Don't forget to sign the attendance sheet. And I'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Bye. Good night.